Thanks for coming. Hi again to those I've seen in the last couple of days. I'm Josh Jordan. I'm the digital fabrication manager here, and I also operate the fabrication shops. Um, um, so, was, which is why it's great that I'm introducing our guest, uh, Vincente Reich, tonight, and he's coming to GSAP at the perfect time, because uh, this is the most energized and still healthy moment of the year for our first year students in their first design studio. Uh, so we get you when you're, you're most optimistic and vulnerable. Um, Vincent is the, so Vincent is the head of a studio with his own name in Rotterdam and is among other things a prolific and essential model maker, also industrial designer, furniture maker, fabricator, consultant. Um, one of the things that we know best about him, and you've probably seen his work if you hadn't heard his name, is his collaborations with OMA, which go back in Rotterdam for most of the time that OMA has, has been in Rotterdam. And so uh, Dean Andreas has asked me to introduce this tonight, uh, just to put it in the context a little bit of what's happening uh, at GSAP, one being the issue of making things, um, us trying to, to talk about that as much as possible as the year begins, what that means for our version of design education. And the other is a look at the sort of expanding and expanded scope of design practice. Uh, architects in other roles, non-architects who are doing architecture, and try to draw a shape around both of them evolving design practice. Um, so in my world, we're looking to the fab shop here at GSAP uh, to have an expanded capacity to be more of a design studio and a production line for, for the studios. Uh, work together reciprocally, reciprocally, a bit, reciprocally a little bit more. Um, equipping it with the tools and the people that we need to have that conversation. Um, and for the larger notion of the expanded scope, uh, Vincent is here tonight in a sequence of events at GSAP, uh, including our panel earlier today and the other architect exhibition, which is opening next week, and a whole lot of more um, sort of granular interventions in the studio course. Um, that we're trying to think of as all being connected in this conversation. Um, all right, so now that we're like semi-located, um, I'm going to do a complicated uh, nested introduction of Vincent by introducing Dan Wood, uh, who will give um, Vincent a proper introduction. So uh, Dan, if you know him, uh, is a um, partner with them all at a work architecture company since I guess at least 2003. Um, and he's, he also worked in Rotterdam for RMA for 10 years. Um, and so he's, he's met Vincent before, so I'm going to turn it over to Dan. Okay. Hi, everybody. This is my first, probably last introduction, but very excited. Uh, so Vincent de Rijk. And Amal made me write everything down. She said that's how she does it, so that's how I do it. Uh, so who, who is this guy, Vincent? Uh, well, you can see on the poster that Vincent is a model maker, so that's easy. He makes models for architects, uh, but unfortunately there's no other model maker like Vincent in the world, uh, and maybe not in history. He can make a model of the building the architect wanted to design but just hadn't thought of it yet uh, until they see the model that Vincent has made. So Vincent obviously is not just a model maker, he's a designer, uh, and he's an industrial designer. His uh, ceramic and resin work is in MoMA's permanent collection, uh, and it's sold around the world. Uh, but the things that he designs are not really like anything any other industrial designer designs. Uh, and he can go years without designing anything or making anything in ceramic anymore. Uh, and he makes everything himself in his workshop. So that's very different too. So I guess he's then a maker or a fabricator. Uh, so definitely he's that, but of course he's not that at, at all either. Uh, the Werkplatz is not a factory churning out the product, uh, so when Vince gets tired of making bowls, he just stops making them. <laughs> Although I heard now maybe China will step in, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So maybe we can call him an artist, uh, which it might be a good description for him, but I, for me, the word I always think when I think about Vince is, is uh, a magician. So I'm going to tell a story about myself a little bit. I graduated here at Columbia in 1992. There was no work. There was nothing. Uh, it was the worst recession for architects in history. Um, so we, some friends of mine from school here, set up a model shop in Brooklyn uh, working for MoMA. We were building Frank Lloyd Wright house models um, in, in 1992. Uh, and so we did that for a while. And then in 1994, MoMA called me up and said that 
OMA, Ram Colas is having an exhibition, and they need a little help with the finishing touches on some models. Uh, so I said, that's fine, you know, and so I met Vincent before I met Rem. He was uh, covered in plaster dust, uh, which I thought was weird for finishing touches, and then we got into the gallery and realized finishing touches was like the understatement of the decade. Uh, <laughs> models, some models were just broken, that, those were the easy ones. Uh, some of them were unfinished, uh, some Rem had just thought of like the day before he left, I think. Uh, so that was a totally crazy couple of weeks. Vincent slept on my couch uh, and um, within a few minutes of working together I realized that this guy is working on a different planet and actually I knew nothing about making models. We used to make models at, here at Columbia out of uh, basswood, that was all we did, so that's what we did in our model shop. Uh, but Vincent uses polyester, resin, plaster, concrete, solid alum aluminum. He puts lighting in his models. There are motors in his models. Uh, and if there's not a good material to represent something, Vincent just in invents it. He literally, he literally makes materials appear out of thin air. That's part of the magic. So I convinced Rem to hire me, and I moved to Rotterdam. Uh, and Vincent and his wife Carla returned the favor. I had slept on, he had slept on my couch for two weeks, so I stayed on his couch for six months. <laughs> <laughs> And then since my job at OMA was making models, I spent a lot of time with Vincent in his workshop. And that's when I realized all over again that not only was I completely wrong about making models and what Vincent did, but I actually didn't know anything about architecture either. Uh, so the way it worked in the office was that Rem would call in Vincent after we had, after the blue foam period, let's say. So there was the blue foam period and all these options, and then we would have a kind of half idea. And that would be when Rem would say, okay, let's get Vincent in here. Let's, let's, uh, let's figure out what we're doing. So we would have like, I remember, I seem to remember it was like a five minute meeting with Vincent, like this is the, our idea, and he would kind of smile like, that's kind of a dumb idea or <laughs> something. And then Rem would leave and uh, we would talk 20 minutes about logistics and maybe money, I don't know. And then Vincent would go back and make some magic. And then often a team from the office would go over to the workplace, work plots and work with, with Vince, which was just amazing, like Zen, I still can remember like this milling machine that we used. It's like my favorite thing in the world. I always wanted to be like a production factory line worker. It was kind of like that. Uh, so, and Rem would go back and forth all the time. I mean, I think Rem actually liked the model shop as much as I did. He was there all the time back the, in those days, uh, changing things, looking at things. Vince would make colors, samples, and, and, and it was really going back and forth. This was really where the design happened. Um, you know, Rem, I, I think Rem felt the magic as well. Uh, so when Vincent finishes the model, that's when the project is finally there. Before Vincent's model, the project would be simplistic, diagrammatic, clunky. After Vincent's model, it would have Elan, intellect, surrealism. Vincent didn't just make models, he made OMA. His models of TGB, the Bordeaux House, Universal, IIT, Seattle Library, CCTV are not only records of this design process, uh, they're often the best possible representation uh, of the project and the development of an early idea. And, and many of the models have come to define how we think about these projects, especially the unbuilt ones. Vincent was an essential collaborator in the office, involved in almost every important project in the 10 years I was there. And his imprint and thinking is everywhere on OMA. Uh, even as he himself, I think, would prefer to just simply be invisible. But that's because he's a magician. He likes invisibility. Uh, but just like David Copperfield, you know, the, front, the, uh, the stunts have to get bigger. The tricks have to get bigger. So Vincent said, became so important to the office that we would try to replicate his model materials in one-to-one -one materials. Uh, and then he started making things at one-to-one -one too. So in the Bordeaux house, for example, only Vincent could have made the sinks that you've probably seen pictures of. Those are his. Uh, the resin bookshelves that line the, the, the elevator in the house, those are his. Uh, we had used some pieces of sponge in Prada, and Vincent figured out how to make sponge in real life, blown up to scale. Uh, and then somehow he made a mold for resin and aluminum and, and I have no idea how he does it, and I was there the whole time. <laughs> That's a good magician. Uh, he has an annoying tendency, too. He, he's kind of like Rem. He does the most unanticipated thing uh, sometimes, and it, and it always turns out, turns out good. He, he has a kind of zen-like quality. 
So all of this model making for Ome is on top of his own design and production work. He works for other architects. Uh, he's formed some very important design collaborations with other well-known Dutch designers, and he teaches as well. Uh, and he remains one of the kindest, gentlest, and most calm Zen people I know in the midst of deadlines, fumes, dust, screaming architects, screaming Dutch architects, uh, injuries, even fire, models being put through bandsaws uh, by accident. Uh, he just continues doing the work with the confidence of someone who knows that the model that had just gotten sawed in half will suddenly be shown to the audience whole again uh, as soon as he's done his magic. Here's Vince. That's a nice introduction. <laughs> Thank you for that. It's uh, not uh, the reality, I think. But, uh, um, yeah, so um, yeah, what, I, what, I, what I can do is show a few of the projects um, in the, take you back a bit of, to the beginning time of Paul May when we started there. Exactly what uh, Dan was saying, uh, in, in, in a bad economic uh, recession, even a bit before that, late 80s we started, and um, the, uh, the office was also in really bad shape. Uh, I moved from Eindhoven to Rotterdam with a group of friends. They said, well, we have to go to Rotterdam, that's, that's uh, where it's going to happen, and I, uh, I followed them. And uh, it was also because it was, uh, the, the city was uh, apparently very cheap, that, that was nice for starting people. And um, uh, so, uh, yeah, we, we went there, but uh, then also we found out, oh, is it working? Uh, it was working before, no? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I changed the order a bit. No. Uh, yeah, we, start, we go back to Rotterdam in that time. This is how it looked like. <laughs> you remember it, Dan? I remember And uh, this, this was like my street where we had the workshop. Uh, so it was fun. Uh, even not in this kind of house, but behind it. Uh, but the good thing you could you could find uh, space for free as much as you want, and uh, th this was our workshop um, I I behind the houses, an old garage, and it was uh, yeah, not very comfortable, but good place to start. And before actually the the model making business, I was in, uh, trying to replicate some uh, graduation work, which was this resin ceramic bowl. I spent a lot of time figuring out uh, how to make that combination and uh, also yeah, uh, by learning about these materials um, that's, that's, that's really the base of, uh, of any making process. So um, this, this was quite an impossible task to, to fix these two materials because the, the resin shrinks and the ceramic not and the porosity and the, thick, the, the gluing and everything and the finishing it was a sort of impossible task, but in the end it worked. And this was a sort of yeah, uh, iconic product that could be produced and, and, and sold in galleries and uh, also ended up in some museums. Um, the first project for All May uh, was this uh, architectural institute. Not very impressive result, uh, I must say. We, we were not uh, experienced. I was, I was working with, with, with uh, a few friends, Hans Patesis and Bart Guldemont. They, we were all graduated together. And we were asked by the model maker of Ome at that point, uh, Ron Steiner. He's a, you know him also. Uh, he, he's a funny guy from the States. And he, he was a very precise model maker. Um, and he asked us to join on this model. The office was also in really bad shape. They lost uh, many things. They finished just one building in uh, Den Haag, the, the dance theater, which was a temporary building for a very low budget. It's, it's, it's uh, recently been demolished because it, they couldn't keep it up longer. And uh, uh, they lost a lot of money in that uh, 
project because they, wa they had way too much ambition for the budget that it was. And uh, yeah, the office was close to bankrupt and they needed de uh, desperately a new project and REM wanted to win this competition of the National uh, Architectural Institute in Rotterdam. So he had a fair chance to win, but um, we were very inexperienced and we, had, we worked together with many people at the office and we assumed that they would know what we were doing and uh, so they decided, well, we, we were making the building and the office was making the base and, uh, and then in the end we would put it together, but there was only one big problem, they made the base out of concrete and uh, there's like a million columns in, um, in the building, the, the roof is sloping, so we had to fix it in the concrete but that was impossible to make these tiny holes in the concrete, so we fixed it to the roof. And by that, covering everything that was inside, and that was the whole point of the building, was the interior, and not the outside, it's just the triangle. So um, Rem was quite furious, and he ripped off the roof and, uh, and destroyed the model and lost the competition. So, <laughs> <laughs> so not, not a good start. But um, there was another guy, uh, Adrian Geuze, he now has a big office, uh, West Acht is his office, uh, in landscape architecture. He was very young and just uh, entered this Prix de Rome uh, important competition in Holland uh, for landscape architect. Till then all the landscape models were about parks and grass and green and he, uh, he was emphasizing on these leftover industrial areas and to see uh, how to revive them or how to use them for new functions or how to make it into public spaces. And that was quite a visionary thing to do and he won the prize. Uh, and we made this model, of course there was no budget and no time and so we just made few elements, no landscape at all and that was also the, the the, the quite radical thing to do. So all these things were on little sticks on the floor and it filled the entire room because we used it in the real scale. So if this, this, the distance, it's not really this distance, but in reality they were like meters apart, like, like, uh, like in the real scale. So it was a total radical way uh, of thinking by, by Adrian. He now um, has a big office and he's doing this uh, project now here in New York, so the, the Governor's Island. He's, he's uh, uh, doing the complete landscape of it. So it's, it's, uh, you, can, you can see that like this uh, uh, visionary start also, it was, it was not uh, an incident, he was really a, a genius. So this, this, this is the workshop with the, the balls you just saw. And uh, because there was of course not always something to do, I had to have this, uh, this more uh, continuous work and I was producing the cups, uh, very simple cups, uh, but a bit, a bit of sort of, I was trying to find a production technique that was uh, actually efficient enough to self-produce. So there was only three little actions like casting, glazing, and firing, and there was three minutes of work per bowl, so we could even produce them cheap and uh, by that uh, also in large quantities and sell it. Actually most of it is uh, sold here in the United States. There's a, a company here called Kickerland. Uh, it's a Dutch guy, Jan van der Lande, and he's, he's now a big company. Uh, and he, sell, he started selling Dutch design and, and still does the business. Uh, it was really funny and almost 90% of everything that we made was uh, sold by him. Uh, so the way we did it was, uh, we, it's one shape and then uh, only glazed on the inside and then random colors and then just sort them out in, in little sets so that the color sets were all uh, different Then firing it and uh, uh, so this is done all the types of colors. So each, each, each set was a bit unique and then a little package and, and so minimum amount of work and uh, a good, good base for, for continuous work. Later I developed it into a set of different shapes. Uh, 
But this was much harder to produce, of course. You need so many different molds, so I only made, made a few of these sets. But you, could, you can see it as a complete set of tableware, but it, it's seen as a different, it's a bit different because you have only one shape of everything. But in, in total, it's a, a complete set of tableware. So this is the, like, like the process of finding out and the color sets. And, but uh, what I said before, the, the, uh, the, the experience of working with these materials was uh, very practical to have also for the model making. And I think that that was what Rem quickly saw, that how he could use these colored materials, the, the, the plaster, the casting, and the polyester. He, he, it was actually him that suggested uh, why don't you use that for the models, not only for the ceramic. Uh, so this, this was the first project we did uh, out of this plaster models. It's, um, oh, sorry. Um, it's a sea terminal in Zeebrugge, as you can see. And it was funny because one of the project architects, uh, Xavier de Geiter, Belgian guy, uh, he was calling me up on, on, on Easter Sunday. To, uh, <laughs> he needed a sort of, he was describing what he wanted, a sort of round thing, it's a sort of tower, maybe like this radar thing on a ship. I said, oh, it's an egg, like it's Easter, you know. It's <laughs> so I made an egg for him, but then he had, yeah, it was too funny, so he, he, he changed it a bit into a flat shape, and uh, that was the, the thing. And we used this for uh, vacuum forming, um, directly, and in that time, uh, there was really little time to make things. This was only uh, uh, two days, but then every one of the office came to help, and also Ron Steiner was, he was really good in these precise details. And uh, so this way we teamed up and we did uh, yeah, what uh, Dan said, the sort of starting point, and the office would help to, f to, to, to finish it. Uh, only the, 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 this was a competition, there was never any conclusion of it. It was, uh, I think, a quite nice project. Um, and also the model was lost, it never returned. Uh, so uh, nobody knows where it is. But, and, and then, then uh, uh, but Ram wanted to show it on the next exhibition. So we made a copy, even twice as big. Uh, uh, we made a new uh, egg and uh, and we uh, projected the, 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 the slide of the other project on it so we could exhibit it. Um, then um, uh, all these projects, of course, were uh, till now without any result and uh, uh, st uh, the off uh, they still needed like a real project to, to get the, the office going. And uh, Rem was really uh, trying to uh, build up more experience also for us uh, to get better at the model making. And he suggested that we would uh, work with the team of OMA three or four times in a summer time on uh, developing one concept to the next concept and, and so on. And there were four competitions, I think we participated in three of it to make the model. And this was uh, the, the, the last one, the, the Thai Grand Bibliothèque in Paris. And this was, yeah, also, I guess, a key project for that time in the office. It's, um, the outside is more or less a cube, and inside all kinds of uh, shapes happen by, by making voids in the floors. Basically, that's, that's what it is. So this was the competition model. The, the, this was the kind of information we got from the office. <laughs> 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 And uh, so this is, uh, uh, but of course, uh, we had, it was always a cooperation with, with uh, people of the team, and Rem was every day there, and he would like to help, but he's, 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 he's quite brilliant, but not so much with his hands. So, so <laughs> uh, <laughs> he's, he's a model maker in his head, but uh, uh, so we would always say, uh, Oh, don't do that, Ram, it's bad for your fingers. It's, uh... <laughs> <laughs> and he, but then he was like, even, yeah, trying to help with all kinds of things. But he was always there to, to be involved in the, in the conceptual phase and to make decisions. And 
to, 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 to think about this was the sort of entrance level and also the, the conceptual part that how can you define these voids in the building and what, what kind of possibilities does that give you. This was the, the way we made it with layers and then objects in it, but it was very complicated. Uh, it, was, it didn't do the job actually because uh, there was no uh, physical presentation, only uh, you could handle in the model with I don't know how many other uh, uh, competitors and the jury would uh, just look at that and make a decision. And since this was basically a square, now you see nice light behind it, but in reality it was a white box. Um, uh, it, it, it really didn't uh, work. Uh, and also this one, he didn't win. Uh, although it's one of the key projects of, of that time in the office. Um, so here you see we're trying to get it out of the model shop. We had only very small doors. Uh, then then uh, Rem was so happy with this project that he wanted to show this again for an exhibition in Amsterdam uh, in the Stedelijk Museum. He got uh, one space there to fill. Uh, the question was show the public one project uh, and this question was asked to many artists, designers, uh, fashion designers, like uh, to, to, to show one project so that the, in a way that the, the general public could understand. So that, mean, uh, that meant that uh, we had to somehow make it more um, uh, understandable, the concept, and the way to do it uh, I, I suggested to, to make something with plaster. He, he, he hated that because he saw problems with that before. Um, but then suddenly he, he, he thought of the option of if you work with plaster, you can do the positive and the negative version because you can cast the objects on top of each other and show two models in one uh, show. Uh, one will be positive, one will be negative. So. That, that's, uh, that was a good idea, and uh, so we tried to do that. There was, uh, the other people in the office were trying to represent this in the computer. This, this was like a sort of magic for that time, like how to, how to make an egg and, and a spiral, and, and that, that took the, the, the computer department about three weeks to produce this picture. <laughs> <laughs> they had expensive telephone lines open for 24 hours to, to get all the data through it and, and this was the, <laughs> you can do it in SketchUp in five minutes now, I think uh, it's quite funny to see. Um, but so I asked uh, Rem to produce a sort of more book where everything is um, more clear in layers and sections so that I would know what to do. Uh, so the, the, this book was specially produced for, for making it clear and I, I used it for, as a sort of working drawing for the, the pre preparation of this plaster model. You see all the levels, it's actually quite nice if you think like, the concept um, is to, 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 to carve out of the cube all the public spaces, so you have to imagine all the black stuff is library. Uh, so compact uh, uh, storage of books and the white things are public spaces or restaurants or, or, or transport uh, and the, the square things are the uh, elevators. So this, this was the, the, the sections in this way. So in, by, by having this, it's, it's, for, it's of course not very accurate because nothing is made from the 3D model. It's just made up by drawing manually the sections. Um, and the interiors, and the dimension plan of what is it? The superposition, and uh, the f so it was a very complete. Someone I don't know who made it, but it was very helpful. Uh, and so this was my sketchy uh, uh, cardboard model to to start the plaster model. I, I decided to make it in vertical slabs, and uh, it was the scale was one to hundred. And in reality, the model was about, uh, the project was about 100 meters square, a bit like something like 90 meters in the, uh, and, and a bit more in the height. Uh, so almost a cubic meter of plaster, which, which means that it weighs about 3,000 kilos 
in the end. So that was a bit of a problem. So very simple techniques, uh, improvised molds with plastic and wood, and then uh, yeah, all these shapes could be made. And it was a really nice thing to make and also to experience uh, that with the basic techniques of plaster you can do uh, uh, quite nice things. And it was not hard to make. Uh, and also potentially uh, <laughs> to copy. Now you see if the uh, very primitive <laughs> stone age. Uh, we had to produce all these eggs. It's, uh, and here are, so here are all the negative spaces, uh, but then in a double set because we need one to produce the positive and one we used in the, in the negative version. So then we put everything back in the box and layer by layer uh, fill it up. And the, the aluminum sticks are the elevators. They stay also in there. So uh, here it's <laughs> done. This was 24 hours before the opening of the exhibition. And, uh, and we still had two models in one block, so, so it was a bit scary. But you, you never know if you forget to put soap in between them, then it will be forever a square meter of plaster. And, um, but it, it all worked out, and here it's in the museum. The picture on the back is the competition model. They enlarged it, and uh, all the, the pictures of the book are, are printed on the, on the wall. And we put this uh, model on the... Uh, you see, Rem was very happy. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the only thing we, 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 we forgot to, 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 uh, that, uh, how to lift this block, and there was no equipment in the museum. So I had to go to my neighbors. They had a little... Uh, Renault Vier uh, uh, garage, uh, these old cars, uh, and we borrowed these, 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 what is it, I don't know the name for it, to, to pump up the, the car uh, for, uh, <laughs> for raise this block in the last month. So it was a lot of improvising. Also, we realized that one of the spaces inside was completely invisible, this, this large uh, spiral, and in the, in the, in the book uh, was always a sort of cloudy, Facade, so Rem uh, took a chisel and he just hammered the, the hole in there and then you could look <laughs> inside. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was all very quick and easy. Um, but this, this was the result and uh, I, think, uh, this, I think we also showed it in the MoMA exhibition, no? Or, yeah. Yeah. Um, not the big one in the back because that was very heavy to transport, but this was quite uh, doable. So it's, it's, it's uh, um, you can also imagine that it really um, can convey the, the, the message to the public that if you say this is a building and it's the positive and the negative, the inside space and the outside facades, then people will understand it. And, and at the same time, it's a sort of object. So uh, with the same guy of the garage, he was good at repairing these motorcycle tanks, uh, so we asked him to join in for the next model, uh, Agadir. It's not a well-known project, I think, but it's, it, it was also one of the best things out of that period, I think. Uh, it was a competition. Uh, again, never heard anything of it uh, by the organization. Um, but it's basically two shells and a, and a big space in between. It's supposed to be on the beach, so the, the, the first level is the continuation of the sand of the beach, and it's completely embedded in there. And on the roof, there was this hotel with all these patios. And inside, then, these kind of, um, yeah, wavy um, uh, landscape would appear. I think this model was also there, and then uh, Rem gave it to the, to the museum. It's still there in the collection. Uh, so this was a, yeah, the, the, the conceptual way of, of, of working in the, uh, in the office was, for me, still quite hard to understand, like how to read this diagram and make something out of it. <laughs> 
that uh, it became something like this, a sort of lasagna of, uh, of, 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 of matter and, and, and space and uh, layers and colored blocks. And also a lot of people of the office joined in and found out how, uh, uh, the joy of, of uh, just putting colored blocks in there and defining the, the, the concept. Uh, so very rough and quick and sketchy models. Uh, so the technique of using this resin was now uh, more explored and, and more like part of the language. This was a city plan in, in Almere, a bit boring project, but at least it paid some bills for the office. Um, and uh, yeah, we, we, made, we, we also got a nice commission to make this model for the city, also to at least uh, get a bit better paid than, than the office would usually offer us. Uh, other, other architects that are quite well known in Holland, Ben van Berkel, he does now most of the uh, uh, train station buildings in Holland. He started with this more um, expressive shapes. Uh, not easy to make because there was nothing like computers or 3D printers to, to, to help producing it. Uh, so it was complicated and uh, to, to make, but uh, also a learning process. Uh, one project that's there's very little material left of it in OMA, but Rem, one of Rem's favorite projects, Togok Towers. It's also a competition that uh, for some Asian country, I don't even know where. Uh, I think Korea. Or, um, and it was sent in and never heard of it. There's Sarah and Min, or what's his name, you know? Um, so many nice people in the office. Uh, we made like this kind of platforms and it's all sketchy and there was also a lot of electronic stuff in there and we had uh, Cloudy for that. He, he, he's a sort of genius for making all these circuit boards and, uh, and we made the whole base look like it. The tower was lighted up with some kind of program, quite a nice thing, but then there are no pictures of the project and no result and just this, these few things. This is uh, MVRV, uh, the office of Winnie Maas. He's, uh, uh, yeah, he, he's one of the best examples of offices that started from all May. When, when, when I started making models, Winnie was there also as an intern actually, and now he's one of the biggest uh, architects. Um, it's, it's, it's the island in Paris where uh, Pinot, the guy, the very rich guy that owns all these luxury brands, uh, he wanted to make his own museum. He has a large collection. And it's the island where the Renault factories are. That's all these uh, steel things in the back. And he wants to, uh, when he wants to make a museum completely over it and introduce his own subway line under the river to the island. That's this snake-like uh, object. Um, so, but it didn't win. Also, uh, yeah, this kind of blob architecture was getting into fashion. And we had, uh, I rented part of my studio to an uh, architect called uh, Lars Spybroek. And uh, he's, he's a very a sort of weird professor and he was really into this uh, complicated structures and he built this um, building somewhere in Zealand in Holland and we made this model. Uh, this, this was something that Rem is uh, working on for a long time. Uh, this was next to his office on the boompjes in the center of Rotterdam. You see one of the bridges over the Maas, the Willemsbrug, and next to it he projected this idea. He, for years he tried to realize it with developers and with city people and it never worked. This was in 94, I think. But then in some, some um, uh, miraculous way, now you have the, the Rotterdam, it's called, this building. It's next to the Erasmusburg. And it, it, it still has a lot of 
connection with this. So thus the core of it is, is, is still in there. And it's a really great building. And uh, it's amazing that, that, it, that it's done. It's, it's it, it, um, uh, maybe not so impressive for a New York standards, but it's the biggest building in Holland. <laughs> it's, uh, so, and even the people, uh, that's the nice thing in Rotterdam, the, 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 the general public, they, they like it. If there's new stuff appearing, they're not, they're not complaining, they, they, they like it. So everyone likes it. This is the, the biggest project of Dan, I think, the, the uh, Universal Studios. I don't have a lot of material about it. This is one of the things. Uh, we made some parts in the studio. Most of it, I think, is done in, 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 in OMA's workshop. And, uh, but we, we, we definitely were involved at some point. And uh, I don't know, this also resulted in the end in nothing. No, <laughs> no project, a lot of, it's so frustrating. But, um, <laughs> but especially for the architects, I guess. Uh, this was in the exhibition in Berlin. So, uh, Edgar, you know Edgar still? Yeah, he was, he was working on, on the building machine. These are parts and all kinds of people that worked in the office back then. And you see, we're working together um, on, a, on a model um, uh, for, what was it, Geneva? Or? I guess so. Um, I don't know. It was, it was, we were just uh, very much into polyester casting, but I don't even remember what, what, the, what the, the idea of this project was. Uh, the, <laughs> the Bordeaux house was, of course, a nice thing to do. Uh, it, 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 it's a really nice story about the... the the guy that, that commissioned it, he, uh, well, actually not so nice, he got this accident and uh, lived in a wheelchair from then on and Rem started completely over with the design of his house and made it so that it was uh, uh, favorable for a handicapped person but not for a uh, uh, non-handicapped person. So if you would walk in the living room, you would uh, hit your head uh, uh, on, the, on, on several construction beams, and the guy with the wheelchair could just drive under it. So uh, he had an advantage. And he had um, an elevator. It's not shown in this model. This, this was a, a one-day model that, uh, that he made, I don't know for what occasion, uh, probably uh, some, yeah, somewhere in the process. It's, it's now also in the collection of the MoMA, and it was... Um, uh, I, I remember I worked on this with Franz Potasius, my friend, and we only had one day, and there was very little information, there was no facade, and uh, so Rem asked us to do some uh, proposals for the, for, the, for the facade, and he said, do something with holes. No, well, this is, you did that, you just randomly <laughs> drilled some holes in a piece of hard, hardboard, or what is it, mazonite or something. And uh, I looked at it and I said, no, this cannot be right, so let's throw that in the garbage. But then, <laughs> and then Rem came by and he said, where are the, where are the proposals? He said, well, we have this and this and this. And I, I made many things. But then he never liked it. And he said, uh, don't you have anything else? Uh, I said, no, well, there were some things in the garbage. And he picked it out. Well, it's anyway better. <laughs> so, so then... This, um, uh, this, this are the things that can happen uh, at, at Ome. It's, it's, uh, it's nice. And if you look at the house uh, now, this is the section. This is how it looks. It's, it's, it's exactly <laughs> copied. <laughs> so they even replicated the color of the, of the, of, of the hardboard that we used in the, in the concrete, which, which was, not, was not easy to do. But they wanted to have <laughs> exactly the same whole pattern and... and, and and, and, and co uh, uh, color. This is the shelf. Actually, the whole interior was des designed by Maarten van Severen, a Belgium designer. He's, uh, he doesn't live anymore. Um, but this was uh, one of his 
nicest project. He was really brilliant uh, designer. He made very famous chairs and stuff. But uh, he was not working all the time. He was traveling a lot. And, but he did these incidents, and they were always great. And he was asked by them to do the interior uh, of the house, and he designed this bookcase. Um, but he wanted to produce everything himself, but that was, was so hard, and in the end he got a time problem, a money problem, and Rem suggested that we would take over some of the work and uh, make, for instance, these this shelves. Uh, it's, it's glass and resin, and it had to hold a lot of weight. It's quite high, and it had to be very thin, so the specifications were hard. Um, but uh, so uh, it was only made possible with glass and a thin layer of resin. So the, the, the idea of the, uh, the one-day model was, was introduced before, and it was a good way of, of uh, doing competitions. This, this was a competition in Cordoba, um, uh, which was in the office a popular project, but also no price. Uh, so, uh, but it, 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 it represented the concept of the model uh, also in a very short time, something like a day. Later, uh, the Rem wanted to make a, a, a more elaborate model. Uh, the, the, the design was actually progressed in, in several stages, but uh, never executed. And now, uh, there was this opportunity to make a model also for the MoMA. They had a big show on European design or big projects. I don't remember exactly the name of the show. And we, we were commissioned to make this thing. But if you see how the, the, the concept develops into the real building, I think uh, it also loses something. Now it becomes just a beam with a theater or, or a, a seating area next to it while in the concept, it was more like a sandwich with, with program squished in between it. Um, this is a model for Embry-RV, the I-beam building, which uh, is now built by Sejima, I think. Never built. What was the museum then uh, that they built? Well, something else. Uh, it was never built. Uh, it was also, when we made this model, it was exactly at the time of the 9-11 disaster. So we saw it happen and while uh, on the television and uh, while we were making a project for almost the same space. Um, this is one of the things that we, yeah, uh, uh, Dan was explaining, we cut the model in half to see the inside and then that, uh, which is actually necessary because it's all about how the shapes uh, work inside. But this, the, the, the techniques of this is very simple. It's only polystyrene uh, plastic sheet, what, what every model maker uses, then vacuum formed and glued together and perforated and a few other things, and then uh, uh, make, make something out of it. The CCTV was one of the yeah, big projects of the OMA. That area in, I think, what was it 2001 or? I think so, 2001. Um, and Rem was obsessed with winning this thing, uh, and he was also in agreeing that we should adapt to the style of the Asian model making, uh, so make everything detailed and precise and literal. Uh, he was really keen on that. But every time he came to comment on the model, he completely wanted the opposite. He, 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 he couldn't just get it out, out of his, uh, he, uh, he couldn't make it. Uh, so every time when we made these literal details, he hated it. So he always go, was going back to his solid blocks and simple materials and wooden base. And uh, everyone was warning him that it was too abstract, that the Chinese would not like that. And, uh, uh, but this was what we sent in, and they, they were rejected. Like, not even didn't win, it was not even accepted <laughs> as a model. <laughs> this is no model. That, uh, <laughs> so, um, 
Ben Ram understood. <laughs> and uh, he was going to China and worked with local people there and made uh, a new model and uh, asked permission to send it in again. And then finally he won. So uh, uh, it was a bit cheating. So uh, we, uh, we, we, we learned from that. And the next Asian project was this uh, theater in Taipei. Um, it was also a strange moment that the, 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 the office was in sort of financial problem. They had a new financial director. And what he did, he, uh, it was in October. And he said, OK, everyone, it's a holiday. Uh, <laughs> it's Christmas holiday. It starts now. And <laughs> come back in January. So, so uh, the, the office was completely empty and locked up even. Uh, nobody was there. It was just to save money. And uh, 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 Rem was asking me to, to make a model for this. And we went to the office. He couldn't even get in. <laughs> it was closed, and, he, and uh, the key was changed. So, <laughs> so he, he, uh, he had to come to my workshop every day. He, he, he doesn't like that, but uh, we have at least a swimming pool nearby that he can take an hour of swim in between. And then, uh, but he was there every day to comment on this, and he was really on top of everything. Uh, also communicated with, uh, uh, with the Asian team that was still active in uh, Taipei, um, quite a big team actually, but we did everything here in also a short time. And Rem was exactly, uh, he was also sharp and because I said, if we have to make it in a week, I need at least some um, uh, finalized structure that we can start on. So that, that, then he said, okay, we can make the whole thing as a sort of industrial cage. And then we see later how we deal with that. And so, so we, made, we made this cage out of steel uh, or aluminum. Uh, so that was strong enough to attach all these theaters on the end so that it also would structurally work in the model. And that was also conceptually what Rem wanted to do in this theater. It's a combination of different things that can work together as a bigger theater or specialized theaters. And it's over the marketplace. So this is uh, an important part of Taipei where uh, every day the market is there, and Rem realized that if he wanted to win, he had to keep the marketplace and raise up the building so that it doesn't destroy the market. Uh, that was probably why it was successful also, one of the reasons. Um, so, very simple model, but um, yeah, with the right lighting and photography by Franz Patagius, uh, it was a very, uh, uh, yeah, it did, it did, did quite well. The interior, the, the, we made, even made the interior of that sphere. There was a German girl in the office that was just starting her inter internship, and she wanted to help, and I said, OK, you can make the interior of that <laughs> <laughs> theater. And she did amazing, like uh, <laughs> in, 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 in all the time there was, she did the whole interior. It's very tiny, of course. And this is the reality. It's, going, it's being built now. It's quite, I didn't realize it was so big. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's really huge. And uh, also the, so, oh yeah, this should have been a bit before. It's the, the mold of the CCTV, um, the plaster model. We used a special technique with, with aluminum plates. It's, it's a very old-fashioned technique uh, that uh, the printers of the, the wrap of the cigar, you know, there's, this, there's always this, this piece of paper around it, and then it's a bit embossed. Right? It has relief in it. So they need these plates to make that relief. And you can easily etch it into a magnesium plate. And that's how, so with that technique, uh, we made the mold of this... Uh, um, building. So it's a magnesium etched plate and then we, because Rem would like to have all the people that would work in the building represented on the outside of the building. Um, so 
During the years, we had all, all kinds of leftovers, so we built it up in a sort of system of colors, and this is also the, the starting point of many interior projects uh, that people come in the workshop and they can choose with combination of blocks and colors and, and start to design their own thing. This is made by Gary Bates. Uh, he made a shower for a client, a private client, and, and we made the sort of curved walls to, to make it. This is uh, Eva Pfannes. She's a German architect that lives in Rotterdam. She designed these tables for, for some shops. This is also by her. Uh, it's, it's a plate of resin uh, drilled with holes from under, like, and then from the top it looks like this, and this is the underside, it's just drilled holes in there. This is a cabinet that I made for a client. A sink uh, for uh, friends of me. It's almost like a bar of chocolate that's melting. And a, and a bathtub. This bathtub is made of uh, out of uh, transparent rubber. And uh, it's for uh, Ellen, also the same girl. She's quite small, so, and she wanted to have a uh, a sit, sitting bath, so she can sit in there. It's, it's, you have not, not much space. Um, and it's on a sort of balcony in her house, and she can sit there and look out of the window. And uh, the nice thing about this rubber is it gets soft when it's warm. So when you fill it with water, the whole bathtub gets soft. And uh, <laughs> it's like a baby tub. Lamp uh, with LED lights. Uh, the balls are like also made out of leftovers. If we have mixtures of color, uh, I have molds to make these kind of balls. This is one of the latest things. It's a composition of blocks that make up uh, a sort of shelf. Uh, and you know, it's made for a client. And now the, also the Boymans Museum in Rotterdam ordered one of those. So it's nice. Then, yeah, the material research of the Prada. This is a, a an office model, uh, and they, this is actually quite later in the process, but um, yeah, you can see how the foam, or the sponge, as we called it, was uh, projected in there. Uh, but uh, the, the idea of the sponge was all the time there, and uh, it didn't seem to progress in the materialization, so in, in, in the end, uh, they worked with, with uh, all kinds of high-tech companies and uh, chemical companies, and nobody came up with a solution. So them asked me in the, in somewhere in the process, do you know how to do it? I said, ah, if we can do the, the low-tech way, then, then we can work with balloons or something, and we will figure it out. And uh, so he had that as a backup plan, and that's also what we needed, because in another way, nobody finds a solution of how to produce this foam. It's literally the foam that you know, but then blown up so many times. So this was the sample I made very, very quick to show him the, that it was possible. And he was super happy. He looked at it and said, wow, can you make this? Nate, he asked, can you buy this in bigger blocks? You know, you cannot buy it. You have to make it. <laughs> so then he was even more happy. So we were testing out all these things. And he wanted to have all variations in, in plaster and bigger and smaller. And he would visit many times. Did you see also Ole Sheeran. Um, he was also involved in this project. He actually took it over, more or less, the whole Prada thing. Um, so this was the sample for the shop. Uh, and this was a more or less exactly how it looks. But then, still, it was not easy to, to, to make. This was the mock-up that we showed to uh, Mucha. She came to uh, Rotterdam to uh, and Rem made especially a sort of exhibition in the Kunsthal to show her all the samples. Um, and she was happy. This, uh, this was the final result. It's eventually done by Italian craftsmen that Mucha asked to think of the process uh, after seeing the samples. And she had good craftsmen there. And she said, I asked them first. If they cannot solve it, I come back. But they came up with. Uh, exactly the same techniques and materials as I would use. So then we knew then that they could do it. Uh, so
So, but that was hard to do. It was a lot of work and a lot of investment. And also, so now there, there was at the moment that many designers started to do complicated stuff like Joris Laman, he was a student of me and he's, um, or at the design academy at least, uh, and rented also a small space in our building. And he was working on these chairs. He's doing now even more crazy stuff, uh, but he uh, and works with a New York gallery. Uh, he had this idea, but also not how to make it, so I helped him with, uh, he tried to also do it with 3D printing, but it was too big for that at that moment. So then we sliced the model and just did it the old fashioned way, just make layers, glue it together, uh, and make a wooden model, paint it, and make a mold. So it's really a lot of work, but it's the only way to do it. Uh, this was the sort of starting of, of, of new phenomena, like the, the limited edition of design pieces. So those 12 of these things to be made, that's uh, overseeable at least, and uh, they were sold for high prices, uh, more than 100,000 or something like that. Um, so the whole process, it was, so I'm, I'm, I'm always yeah, interested in doing these things that as long as nobody knows how to do it, then, then, then we can try something. Um, so the mold was built up. Then we had actually the same stuff as I used for the bathtub, but just made it a bit harder. So it's still slightly soft and unbreakable, um, but uh, comfortable to sit on. <laughs> it's actually not very comfortable, <laughs> as you can see. <laughs> So, yeah, and then the production. So it, it's also very nice to, to, to do production. I, I never uh, dislike it because it's, it's, you get better at it and you get it under control and we, uh, you can improve the process and you have to, to make all 12. And it's also, once you reproduce it, it becomes more efficient and you can finally make some money. And then, uh, uh, yeah, it's more rewarding in, in, in the end. And it's also, you can keep everything in-house. In uh, some more examples of models. Uh, project in Paris in cooperation with the office. This is one of the last projects of, well, not really last, but the, of the models that we did. It, it's a sort of super unspecular, unspectacular bridge. There was a competition for a bridge and uh, there were all kinds of ideas, and in the end, uh, Rem said, no, just let's make it straight. <laughs> just a bridge. And by all the, uh, so by saving money to, to keep the bridge simple, he could do other things like uh, make a, the, the highway that was near the river to uh, change the route of that so that the bridge became also involved in the park, that there would be a park on the water. So now there was a highway on the water, and now by making this bridge, there was a bridge which was also twice as wide as normal, as, as necessary for the traffic, so it was also big public space for the uh, uh, walking people, and all kinds of events could happen there. And uh, so it was nice to see that by making something uh, so unspectacular in a way, uh, you can still win the competition if you have, if you show the, the, the benefits uh, of it. And uh, it's not, so it's not typically something that you expect from OMA. Uh, but, uh, and also the model had to be white. So yeah, it's, we tried to make it as detailed as possible and the water effect, yeah, we use the same thing for your box. Um, so, but this, this was one of the last points, but it was in a strange scale, so you also have to produce cars, so I found a way to quickly mass produce the cars with a stick and then sand it and polish it and then you had the car and the people were squeezed pieces of solar wire, a trick that we already used for a long time. Then the PGB also resulted in a new library, it's actually part of this PGB that you see in the back. The exhibition in Paris. Uh, it's the, 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 the cross part is, is, is used as a new library in Cannes and it's and presented as a, as a competition entry and it's also 
um, uh, one competition. Uh, in this case, I got also a lot of help from this guy from the office. He did uh, all the milling work on the machine, and then that can help to reduce the cost and, the, and, the, and, and to, to, to make it efficient for the office. Uh, so it, it was quite large, and you see the, bit, the casting techniques. It's basically making the blocks, gluing them together, then do another action and put a layer of white on it and engrave the interior, all kinds of steps to, to make it, in the end, uh, yeah, a sort of complex thing. Um, then there was another opportunity question from the CCA in Canada. It's in Montreal. It's a very nice architectural institute. Uh, they wanted to show the, the building, which I cannot now because uh, it's a PDF uh, and uh, it's supposed to be a little movie. Um, so we have to miss that. But it was the same process uh, as you saw before, basically. So, okay. And in Montreal, you have um, this institute. They have a very easy uh, business model. They, they got so much money from one person uh, that they can live from the interest. So they only use the interest of the money that they save and they run their whole institute from that. And so they can invite all kinds of people, have shows and never lose money. It's, uh, it's quite nice. So they, they had a good budget to, to make this happen. Uh, we made a copy of it and uh, the copy even was shipped back. And also they used the slides of the old days, uh, they found them somewhere and they projected them on the wall. And it was a nice presentation, one little space in the museum uh, dedicated to one project. And also nice for us that we could reproduce it, go to there, install it. It was a very relaxed atmosphere. Also, um, the, what, what was visible in the bridge, uh, that Ome is also capable of doing very simple, powerful, small projects. Uh, one of the latest, I think, I think the latest project is Reposi. It's a jewelry shop in Paris. This is the Plus Vendome, it's called. It's one of the chic uh, places in Paris. This green stick here, it's the stand for Napoleon. He's on the top, it's not, he's not on the picture. Um, and uh, in the corner somewhere there, there's a little shop, uh, Reposi, it's a family business. They have jewelry and they asked, does this new girl taking over the family business? She's quite young and she decided to ask Rem to do the interior of the shop. This is the whole shop, is three stories, concept model by the office. Um, it's only 80 or 90 square meters in total, very small, and they used almost all space for just make a uh, staircase. So, uh, <laughs> luckily the jewelry is very small, so <laughs> it fits. Um, and uh, it was quite radical because all, there's no jewelry shown, almost. It's hidden in the wall, it's just a very nice system. It's, the wall is, the wall you see here, the sticks, are actually triangles and they can turn around. And one of the uh, uh, parts is a sort of showcase for the jewelry. It's not very well shown in this drawing actually, but you can see it here. It's supposed to be a screen, an Instagram pa page and, and this, uh, and a mirror, but it became also a display for the jewelry. Uh, they worked also with other designers. This is uh, glass work. Uh, it's a very nice gradient that it's not really showing actually, but it's by uh, Sabine Marcellus. And she made all the wall coverings for that building. And we had to also uh, take care of uh, uh, cooperation with her to match the colors for the cabinets that we made. So this is the color mixing. We make these shelves, a bit like the Bordeaux shelves, so it becomes sort of system. It's a, it's a, a sort of repertoire that we can put in project. It's uh, in the basement of the, that's the only space that they have left, 
to, to, to use. Uh, in the basement of the shop uh, has to be the reception area and the office. So the cabinet is the border of it. So here's the office space and on the other side is the reception for the important clients. So we, so Japanese wall in transparent material. It's uh, not easy to make because there's no visible connection. Uh, so everything is glued, there's no screws or nails or hinges or whatever, and still everything has to function. Another small project, which is, I think, very nice, turned out very nice by the office, is uh, what they call Maggie Center. It's, I think, the last thing to be shown. Um, uh, it's a hospital area where they make, uh, uh, yeah, what they call Maggie Center, is where families can stay with, uh, to have a more friendly atmosphere and uh, do things with their family, like cooking or whatever, therapies, or uh, it's donated by a I don't know who again, but a rich guy in Scotland. And uh, he pays for more of these centers in the United Kingdom. Uh, it's a more, more or less a configuration of rooms, quite small spaces. And they spend a lot of, of the budget actually on the garden. So the garden is, is playing a big role in the atmosphere of the building. It's also in the... Uh, center court of the building and outside. It's in the middle of the city, but they created a nice garden. Uh, and it's also very atypical for an office or, or me to spend uh, a large part of the budget on that and to try to save money on the building, actually, to keep it simple. This is a kitchen. Again, this shelving idea. Here we have, of course, the effect that everything is transparent. Uh, there's a lot of glass and you have the um, the light conditions changing every time and the garden reflection and shades and so the nice thing of these shelves was that it changes all the time and it gets the shadows of the garden this is from outside and it gives this uh, so it's a really nice place uh, so yeah that's uh, that's my workshop in the, in the left and that's what I can tell you about it. So, thank you. presented is that the timeline over which you presented it is also the timeline of the evolution of computing power in architecture mm -hmm. and um, digital, digital technologies in making or, or not along with it. And so I wonder how that's, we saw as your slides progressed, we could see like CNC routers creeping in and um, computerized representations of things creeping in. I wonder how the advances in computing have changed the way you work and changed your practice internally or maybe the way that others um, architects, whoever, can work or not work in 3D with you? Um, yeah, it, it changes things, of course. Uh, especially the, the younger generation of architects that work in the office, they prepare everything digitally. And they come with quite finished uh, computer 3D models. And uh, it's not always easy to find a good starting point in that. So, um, uh, it's not my favorite thing to do, although uh, uh, the, the use of, uh, like what you say, machines, it's, 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 it's very welcome, like the CNC cutting and laser cutting, it's nice to use because it saves 
actual time and introduces more precision and also the materials that I use is very good for not so much for laser cutting but uh, especially for CNC cutting because you can uh, work also in volumes and uh, in all kinds of materials uh, so as long as it uh, makes it still possible to think in, in, in volumes instead of uh, sheets of material, I think it's, 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 it's useful. Although 3D printing, I don't see that as a good alternative yet, because it never looks good. But, uh, <laughs> Even for those little cars? You don't <laughs> Maybe for that. Yeah. No, I just, I think, yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I'm just kind of wondering before we open it up, you know, what, since I experienced the model shop from within the office and as a just graduated student, let's say, you know, I'm wondering if you see a difference in the young people who are working at OMA also, and if, you know, in, kind of because of the computers, how they approach things and you know, I think it, it'd also be interesting to hear, you know, how, how you've seen it over the last 30 years and what, you know, what, what advice, I guess, you would have for young architects starting out. Because it is, it's very difficult to get out of the computer, I have to say. Yeah, I guess so. I mean, yeah. even for us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and we, I don't even know how to use a computer. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a... Uh, uh, you see that the, yeah, the, the, the younger people, they, they spend all their time behind the computer. And that, that once you do that, it's also very time consuming. Because that, that you think, okay, the computer will help to make things easier and quicker. But that doesn't uh, appear to be so. And uh, so even when they come with this computer information, uh, detailed drawings of floor plans or... or areas of the, the surrounding, it's, after that, it's still an enormous amount of work to, to select the right information out of that and to trace all the paths and to combine those lines and whatever is necessary to make it work. Uh, so it's, it, it brings in more work than it saves. And uh, uh, that's the, the paradox of it, I think. So I still prefer to take a piece of material and <laughs> do something with that. Uh, yeah, I think that's maybe, that's what you need. Take, <laughs> take some pieces of material. Maybe, maybe one, you, one yeah. quick last observation on that. In terms of material, um, I think a lot of the starting points for students now is thinking in uh, flat materials, sheet, stock, paper, wood, things that can be cut and shaped in 2D and then built up into 3D. I think that's what the laser cutter does, that's what the CNC does at the most basic sort of 2D level. But it seems like your work all the way along has been working in volume. And so maybe that's a sort of a key. Um, yeah, I think it's also the thing that, that Ren picked up from this casting techniques and he was uh, developing that uh, uh, by always uh, proposing volumes and what happens in there. And uh, so that was a nice click, uh, and uh, it becomes a sort of language, yeah. So it, uh, it, 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 maybe not many people do that, but it, 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 it's uh, because we work with the resin from the other application that we had for it, and to put that into model making, that was also um, the characteristic of 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 OMA and, and Ren at that point. No, I think we should just open it up. I, but I guess we should have said at the beginning, amazing lecture and so nice to see all that stuff again and the new stuff and just so beautiful. That that those walls of color, it's just like you just want to be there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually inspirational. So maybe we open it up for, for questions. Are there questions? There's always questions. <laughs> um, I, 
I, I'm wondering about one thing, which is probably a, a no question, but I found the most fascinating in, in not just like what you showed in terms of techniques and shared in terms of architectures, but also in terms of language and the use that word just now yourself. Is there is there something that stands out for you and maybe also sharing with us like here at the school that you would define as, as particularly Dutch in your language? And I, I think I'm trying to play off uh, Bart Lotzma's super Dutch in a way, right? Like where you kind of like contextualized like Las Bybrook and you showed Van Berkel's work and OMA's work. But there's something very interesting in your work of interpreting architectural ideas and introducing a very particular language of, of making and materiality, if this makes sense. Is there, is there something when you approach a project that, that you bring in um, from the get-go rather than, than uh, the design being the kind of driving force, like the wall of colors, for example? Is there something that, that uh, as a technique that you claim as particularly Dutch in, in your very own way of interpreting? I don't, I don't see it that way, no. Um, because, of course, there's things that you put in the model and then, yeah, if you make a little shell out of resin in the model, it's easy to, to get the question, can you make that in real? <laughs> <laughs> so then we try that. But, um, but it's not intentional. It's... it's, it's uh, uh, it's more like a logical uh, thing to do. And also, it's, I think, only possible in the, in the context of, of OMA work. Because they, they, do, it's, it's, uh, they do crazy stuff. Even if it's impossible, they still want it. And then, uh, uh, and then, we, uh, yeah, then normally you would stop somewhere if it's going to be expensive or too time consuming or. Uh, too much tests, but uh, there, uh, like if them uh, and other people in LMA, if they want something, nobody cares how long it takes or how much it costs. It's uh, not that we. That's the Dutchness. <laughs> <laughs> we are normally very cheap, but. Uh, <laughs> I think the Dutchness is what you call logical. Uh, no one else in the world would agree. <laughs> it's logical. <laughs> <laughs> Alright guys, enjoy your enjoy your weekend. Welcome. Oh wait. There's more questions. Come on. Sorry. I got excited. <laughs> um so are you saying use absolutely no digital methods of technology in terms of the fabrication and model making in your studio? Um, or do you use some like a laser cutter? Yeah, yeah we have a laser cutter. Uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. and, uh, <laughs> it's easy to have. And uh, yeah, and, and uh, CNC milling, that's what I use for a long time. But that, not so much 3D stuff, but more carving out and cutting out blocks. And, 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 uh, but still, it gives a sort of three dimensional effect uh, in, in the. In the volumes um, but but I said that 3d printing I don't see so much nice opportunities for that at the moment um, and but I, it's also because I'm not so used to it I, I'm sure that if you would start now that it would be much more natural to mix all these things up and make something out of it I think it can be fantastic but I, I just missed that part okay. it, uh, So, hi. Um, I was recently at OMA uh, last April in Rotterdam, and I saw all of your samples of the different types of materiality, which I was blown away by. And I was wondering if you have any pointers on approach. How did you go about thinking of like how to mold the different types, or is it? Precise per project, or is there like a constant theme you go through? Uh, which samples are you talking about now? Um, I think they were on like the ground floor and the next to the laser cutting room, and it was like it, I don't know exactly like 
they were a whole bunch of different colors, and then there was also different molds. Um, they were like little squares, little square samples. Uh, in the uh, slides that I showed? No, no, actually in the office in Rotterdam. Oh, in my office? Yeah, I went down. <laughs> Oh, you are. Uh, sorry. I, I was actually that. in the office, sorry, and um, I saw a whole bunch of, because I went through a program through Columbia, and we did a tour of the office in, in Rotterdam. And when, when were you there? Uh, last April. Okay. Uh, I think they worked really hard on those samples yeah, uh, to, to get this repertoire in their workshop, but I didn't make them. There, 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 there's a, a guy that used to work in my studio, mm -hmm. uh, he's actually a jewelry maker, and he, he worked 10 years for me. Uh, now he works uh, in the office of OMA, and he, I think he set up that, uh, that, that sample uh, archive for them, yeah. Ah, uh, okay. So, so that's I, think, what I think in the lecture, Vince had the best advice for how to go about it, which is, mm -hmm. when all else fails, you just look in the trash. <laughs> 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 and pull out what's in there. All right. That, oh, one more. Uh, hi. Uh, thank you so much for the lecture. It was really great. Um, the images were wonderful and everything. I um, I'm particularly interested in your use of uh, like resin because I think you're the one who started that. Uh, and then, like, I guess you started casting resin, and then it started being used in buildings, and you saw these beautiful images of the Maggie Center. And I wonder if you could mention um, like other materials that are used, like the ones that you were working with, is it actually resin? This is the first question I have. And the second question would have to do with archive. Um, how do you archive your models? And I'm sure when you're working, you have to like refer to a lot of models that you've made. Do you keep photographs or like where do you keep all your models? I'm very curious, but. <laughs> <laughs> the models are not mine. <laughs> <laughs> So, the, the, I, I don't have to keep the models, that's, that's easy. Um, but uh, yeah, I keep little offcuts of everything. So when you have made something, then instead of throwing away the scrap, I put it in a box and I number it, that's my archive. And then I remember uh, the conditions and the materials and the techniques, it's in, in this little offcut and then uh, uh, so that's a sort of archive. And we try to make pictures, but it's far from, from complete. So I'm not so much into archiving everything. But I, I think in the office they, they do. Yeah. And in the Maggie Center, is it like resin that's in the building? In the it's end? a material resin. Oh. In, uh, in those buildings, yeah, it's polyester resin, yeah. And, and did you cast it, or like it, w it was casted by the builder, I guess? No, we cast it. Oh, you did it, okay. Yeah, it's really nice. It's really, it, but like, I don't think we can cast resin as a school. <laughs> as, as fabrication manager, you can, but ask me first. Oh. <laughs> but it's you can simple. see, it, it obviously doesn't kill too many brain cells. So. <laughs> 30 years of casting. It, 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 Some is, resin. it is simple. If you can make coffee, you can also cast resin. <laughs> <laughs> Make lots of coffee, everyone. <laughs>